Hello, my name is Lydia Bangura. This is my paper, The Black American Sound. I will be discussing the erasure of Black Americans from the classical music canon, the cultural appropriation of Black sounds, and who is allowed to decide what music is valid. The composer Antonin Dvorak, known for the New World Symphony, commented in the New York Herald in 1883. I am now satisfied that the future music of this country must be founded upon what are called the Negro melodies. This must be the real foundation of any serious and original school of composition to be developed in the United States. These beautiful and varied themes are a product of the soil. They are American. I would like to trace out the individual authorship of the Negro melodies, for it would throw a great deal of light upon the questions I am most deeply interested in at present. These are the folk songs of America, and your composers must turn to them. Dvorak was captivated by the depth, beauty, and force of the Negro spiritual. During his time teaching at the National Conservatory of Music in New York, he would ask H.T. Burley, one of his pupils, to sing spirituals for him. His experience with these Negro melodies was deeply personal, and from his experiences, he encouraged other young American composers to draw inspiration. Since Dvorak's prophecy, the distinct American sound has had time to develop throughout the 20th century. Though he predicted that Black Americans would be an integral part of the American classical music canon, the canon remains largely unchanged. That is to say, it remains white. As I enter into the field of music theory, I'm entering into a conversation that's just beginning. Scholars such as Philip Yule, Lauren Kajikawa, and Alex Ross are asking similar questions of diversity and equity. My goal is to challenge the whiteness of the field, the research, and the Western canon. Amy Beach publicly challenged Dvorak's claim, reasoning that the proportions of the canon should match the demographics of America. She held fast to the melting pot theory, writing a response in 1893. Without the slightest desire to question the beauty of the Negro melodies of which he speaks so highly, or to disparage them on account of their source, I cannot help feeling justified in the belief that they are not fully typical of our country. The African population of the United States is far too small for its songs to be considered American. According to Beach, the Negro's status as a minority disqualifies the Negro experience, vernacular, and melodies from representing America on an international stage. Exclusion and the lack of diversity are simplified to mere side effects, rather than a glaring issue of representation and validity to be addressed. Another possible hypothesis to explain the absence of Black Americans from the American canon is that Blacks during the 20th century didn't have as many opportunities to study and compose classical music. However, even the claim that Black people had less access to traditional instruction and performance opportunities therein proves the point that systemic and institutional inequality is fundamentally behind the exclusion of Blacks in American music. Upon further inspection, many notable composers of color reveal themselves. A number of Black composers contributed large-scale works during the 20th century. In Joseph Horowitz's article from 2019, titled New World Prophecy, he mentions William Grant Still's Afro-American Symphony, Samuel Coleridge Taylor's Hiawatha's Wedding Feast, and Nathaniel Dett's The Ordering of Moses. Despite their efforts to establish a new American school of music, Black Americans found it difficult to break away from the pigeonhole of spirituals. Horowitz commented about Harry Burley. Burley's orbit was further confined because he was not trained to compose for America's signature classical music institution, the orchestra, end quote. 
By elevating the orchestral score and devaluing the spiritual, it further whitewashes the canon and creates more hoops for Black composers to jump through in the search for validity. In this paper, I want to highlight two Chicago-based African-American composers, Florence Price and William Dawson. Alumni of the American Conservatory in Chicago, both composers received recognition for their symphonic works in the 1930s, Price for her symphony in E minor and Dawson for his Negro Folk Symphony. Price's symphony was premiered by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in 1933, making her the first Black woman to have a symphony performed by a major American orchestra. She is also well known for her collection of spirituals, many of which were composed for and performed by Marian Anderson. Dawson is best known for his choral works that were made popular by the Tuskegee Choir. He also received rave reviews for his Negro Folk Symphony, which set him apart at the time as a distinct and unique Black composer. Though Price's goal was not specifically to produce a great Negro symphony, she still incorporated many elements of spirituals in symphony in E minor. The second movement features her own original Negro melody and makes use of the common refrain verse refrain form. The third movement titled Juba Dance is based on the dance that originated in Africa and was transformed by American slaves who didn't have access to drums and other instruments. To substitute, the dance involves foot stamps, hand claps, and thigh slaps, mostly in syncopated rhythms. Here's the opening of the third movement of Price's Symphony. <laughs> Symphony in E minor was praised during the 1930s, receiving widespread attention across the United States. Robert Abbott of the Chicago Defender wrote, When the number was completed, the large auditorium, filled to the brim with music lovers of all races, rang out an applause for the composer and orchestra rendition, and it seemed that the evening could hold no greater thrill. Eleanor Roosevelt commented that Price, quote, has certainly made a contribution to our American music. About Negro Folk Symphony, Pitts Sanborn of the New York World Telegram wrote that the immediate success of the symphony did not give rise to doubts as to its enduring qualities. One is eager to hear it again and yet again. Leonard Liebling of the New York American called his work the most distinctive and promising American symphonic proclamation, which has so far been achieved. Several parties had a hand in these two black composers getting to this level of success. Leopold Stokowski, the conductor who premiered the Negro Folk Symphony, raved about the piece, claiming that, quote, a wonderful development is taking place in American music. Dawson's composition teacher, Adolf Weidig, offered him a scholarship at the American Conservatory. It was Weidig who pushed Dawson to audition for the Chicago Civic Orchestra, of which he was the only Black musician. George Whitefield Chadwick was a large part of Price's education at the New England Conservatory. Chadwick was particularly interested in Negro music and worked with several Black students, including William Grant Still. There were, of course, numerous barriers along the way that contributed to these symphonic works being buried and these composers being further confined into the genre of spirituals. Price found it increasingly difficult to see her pieces performed during the 1940s. She wrote on multiple occasions to Sergei Kusevitsky, conductor of the Boston Symphony, asking him to overlook her status as a Black woman. My dear Dr. Kusevitsky, 
To begin with, I have two handicaps, those of sex and race. I am a woman, and I have some Negro blood in my veins. Knowing the worst, then, would you be good enough to hold in check the possible inclination to regard a woman's composition as long on emotionalism, but short on virility and thought content, until you shall have examined some of my work? Kuzovitsky never responded to Price. White composers and critics of the time further separated themselves from Black music in order to continue the trend of gatekeeping and exclusion. About jazz, Aaron Copeland remarked that the genre had, quote, only two expressions, the well-known blues mood and the wild, abandoned, almost hysterical and grotesque mood so dear to the youth of all ages. Any serious composer who attempted to work within those two moods sooner or later became aware of their severe limitations. Copeland wrote that statement in 1941. However, in 1950, he completed a set of songs for voice and piano, later reworked for voice and orchestra, titled Old American Songs. The first song, called The Boatman's Dance, is based on a minstrel song from 1843 by Dan Emmett, who founded the first blackface minstrel troupe, the Virginia Minstrels. The song features the stevedore, also called a longshoreman, working on the Ohio River during the 19th century. During that time, the word stevedore was used to refer to black slaves who loaded and unloaded cotton barrels onto river boats. The melody follows the same pentatonic scale as Symphony in E minor's second movement and introduces the theme using a similar homophonic texture. Both characteristics are common of the spiritual. Copeland's song also uses similar rhythms to the juba dance, which are held both in the voice pattern and in the strings. Horowitz commented about his style. Copeland's vernacular borrowing and such signature works as El Salon Mexico and Billy the Kid, scrupulously compacted, scrubbed clean of Emersonian mud and scum, not to mention American self-contradiction and racial travail, can seem antiseptic. Here's a comparison of the opening theme of the second movement of Price's Symphony to the opening theme of Copeland's song. As you can see, the pitch content between the two opening themes is exactly the same. And they have that similar homophonic texture common to spirituals. Here's an example of the juba dance rhythm in the voice pattern and in the string rhythms. I went on board the other day to see what the boatman had to say. And there I let my passion loose, they cram me in the calaboose. Oh, dance, the boatman, dance. Oh, dance, the boatman, dance. Oh, dance all night and row dead. I take a home with the gals in the morning. Copeland changed the dialect and wrote two new verses to replace verses that were openly derogatory in order to make the song palatable to modern white audiences. However, he chose to keep in the lyrics, there I let my passion loose and they cram me in the calaboose. Calaboose meaning prison. This is an interesting choice if Copeland's intention was indeed to scrub the song of its racial travail and tensions. Instead, we are left with the vivid image of an enslaved Black man being thrown in prison for letting his passions loose. The jolly presentation of Thomas Hampton singing this song romanticizes the life of the stevedore, which, again, was a life of slavery. 
Despite this obvious contradiction in Copeland's opinion of Black music, the writings of Virgil Thompson and musicologist George Pullen Jackson echoed Copeland's argument, maintaining that American folk music was fundamentally Anglo and white. According to both Jackson and Thompson, Black spirituals arose from white spirituals. It was a popular viewpoint to claim that Black slaves were simply copying the songs they heard from their masters, making it so that the spiritual didn't even originate from Blacks. American composer Edward McDowell held the opinion that the Negro melodies had nothing to do with Americanism in art, a direct influence of his 12 years spent studying in Europe. Music educator Mark Hugh Malone wrote about McDowell, his highly repugnant feelings toward the native plantation music in America were a result of his old world education. This attitude was echoed by his contemporaries, Elson and Ritter, both American musicologists, end quote. Though it might not be the most widespread or obvious viewpoint today, the influence these writings had can be seen in concert programs around the country. Horowitz observed in his article, to this day, new world orchestras mainly play old world music. These sentiments were countered by several musicologists during the early 20th century, who argued in favor of the validity of the Negro melodies. Music historian Gilbert Chase wrote in a response to McDowell, while Dvorak used folk tunes occasionally, his aim was not to provide attractive window dressing for folk songs, but rather to explore ways of musical thinking based on the characteristic rhythms, modalities, and melodic intervals of the folk tunes of a given culture. Alan Locke agreed, claiming in his book, The Negro and His Music, Negro music is the closest approach America has to folk music. And so Negro music is almost as important for the musical culture of America as it is for the spiritual life of the Negro. Music critic and historian Henry E. Kreebel wrote in his book, Afro-American Folk Songs in 1914. Similarities exist between the folk songs of all people. Their overlapping is a necessary consequence of the proximity and interminglings of peoples like modifications of language. If the songs are but copies of the national songs of all nations, military signals, well-known marches, German student songs, etc., why did white men blacken their faces and imitate these imitations? In an effort to dismiss the argument that black melodies are really white melodies in disguise, Kreeble was claiming that the overlapping of characteristics across genres doesn't negate their unique histories and evolutions. The fact that white composers sought to imitate and appropriate these black characteristics shows that they weren't really a part of white music to begin with. The role of black music in the American canon continued to cause discourse throughout the 20th century, coming to a head surrounding the nation's most popular and controversial opera, Porgy and Bess by George Gershwin. Premiered in 1935, the opera features an all-Black cast with original spirituals, though written by a white composer and containing a libretto by white author DuBose Hayward. It still sits in limbo today within the Black community. Many critique the show for its blatant portrayal of common Black stereotypes, such as Blacks in poverty and the use of drugs and violence. While it took time for the work to reach its height of popularity in the United States, the rest of the world was captivated. Porgy and Bess won the attention of composers such as Poulenc and Shostakovich, who claimed that Gershwin was, quote, a composer of great national operas. As a part of his prophecy, Dvorak remarked, whether the songs which must have inspired the composers came from Africa or originated on the plantations matters as little as whether Shakespeare invented his own plots or bartered them from others. The thing to rejoice over is that such lovely songs exist and are sung at the present day. To me, this is where his statements take a dark turn. 
it is a nice sentiment to simply rejoice that such lovely songs exist, but we do not simply rejoice. We praise and idolize composers and performers, both of past and present, and do not require them to cite their sources in the way that we would a researcher. As we see in the conversation today around cultural appropriation, is it true that we only value Black music, Black stories, Black features, and Black lives when they are in some way tied to whiteness? Is the only hope for Black music to achieve its long-awaited mark of validity to be written by white composers? Is Black music by white composers still Black? Shouldn't Black people be the authority on Black music? It really comes down to a select group of white men deciding if Black music has value at all, or what aspects of Black music can be assimilated into the white Western canon. Even the fact that this entire paper is centered around Dvorak, a respected white composer, and his view of the Negro melodies, proves that I care that the music of my people has Dvorak's stamp of approval. Why do I even care about the opinion of a white man from the 19th century? Because that stamp of approval comes with access. It comes with resources and protection of those resources. It comes with the allowance to make the music we want to make. What would it look like for Black people to do the gatekeeping themselves for their own Black canon, to have their own resources and their own agency? While I respect Dvorak's efforts to foster Negro melodies, I can't help finding issue with his statements. I would argue that it does indeed matter where inspiration comes from, especially if one is directly profiting from the oppression, grief, and loss of a marginalized people group. For example, no one can deny that Harry Burley's talent as a baritone and a composer is aspirational and had an effect on Dvorak. However, it would be an incredible disservice for his legacy to be the Black composer who inspired Dvorak. In the same way that Burley had autonomy, ability, and career goals separate from Dvorak, I do not exist to serve only as an inspiration for my white counterparts. Everything I do in music theory and in music performance, I do as a Black woman. It is unmistakable and inescapable, and yet it is a reality from which I do not wish to escape. My blackness should not have to be separated from my work in order for it to be noteworthy. In fact, I make the argument that they could never truly be separate from each other. I resonate with Dawson's sentiments when he remarked in 1932, I've not tried to imitate Beethoven or Brahms, Franck or Ravel, but to be just myself, a Negro. To me, the finest compliment that could be paid my symphony when it has had its premiere is that it unmistakably is not the work of a white man. I want the audience to say, only a Negro could have written that. Thank you.